to welcome everybody to uh, tonight's event, which is, of course, a uh, uh, talk with Ken McLeod. And probably I don't need to introduce Ken to whoever has shown up here. So just briefly, I will say, uh, uh, Ken is my friend. I really like this guy. <laughs> we, we go for walks together and stuff. And uh, he tells me that he uh, is a uh, translator of Tibetan Buddhist texts and writer of books commenting on those texts former teacher of Tibetan Buddhism and current uh, sort of uh, eminence gris of Western <laughs> Tibetan uh, study, uh, <coughs> commentary and so forth. Oh, dear. <laughs> How is that? So I feel so ancient. <laughs> <laughs> I could have said eminence, eminence ancien or something. But <laughs> well... Michael told me, we're going to have fun here tonight. Michael told me to tell a story to begin. So uh, I know a lot of stories, but there's a person in the Middle East who's very well known, basically from Beijing to Morocco. His name was Mullah Nasruddin. How many of you have heard of Mullah Nasruddin? Oh, for many people, this is going to be your introduction. I'm so sorry. <laughs> On one occasion, Nasruddin was asked to give the sermon at the mosque, the town mosque. So he walked in, mounted the uh, podium, the lectern in front of him, and said in a very loud voice, How many of you know what I'm going to talk about today. And people said, we don't know what you're going to talk about today. Oh, you're too ignorant, and he walked out. They prevailed on him to come back the next day, and he mounted the podium again and said, how many of you don't know what I'm going to talk about today? No, sorry. How many of you know what I'm going to talk about today? He said, everybody said, we know what you're going to talk about. Today. Very good. There's no point in me giving a talk. <laughs> they prevailed on him one more time. So he came. How many of you know what I'm going to talk about today? Well, they were prepared this time. Half of us do, and half of us don't. <laughs> Excellent. Those of you who do can explain it to those of you who don't and walk out. <laughs> so how many of you know what I'm going to talk about today? <laughs> <laughs> A third of them do. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get at it that way, Michael. <laughs> I've written a number of books now, and uh, <coughs> they're all rather deceptive, I, I'm afraid. Uh, the first book, I mean, it's not, uh, not the first book I wrote, it's the first book that's uh, in my recent set of books, Wake Up to Your Life. A number of you know this book, right? Well, as my ex-wife said, I can't figure out why it is that when you, re after I've read a couple of pages, I'm trying to figure out where the baseball bat came from. It just looks like a nice big book. But it, a lot of people, even very experienced people, find it communicates a lot. I tend to write densely. And then uh, the next book I'm thinking of is Reflections on Silver River, which... Uh, it's a very simple book. It's a poem by a 14th century monk that became one of the most revered poems in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, it's a celebration and teaching on bodhicitta, awakening mind. Uh, one that more than a few lamas, it's the only thing they teach. Wherever they go, that's what they talk about. 
so it seems, it's deceptive in the sense that it seems like a very simple book and it's just, you know, very uh, banal adages. But when you actually take them apart and go into them, they carry a little more depth. The third book I think a number of you have had a look at. It's The Trackless Path. Uh, it's about Dzogchen uh, and uh, direct awareness. Uh, it's also deceptive because it uh, pretends to uh, talk about that which cannot be talked about. In between, now, Reflections on Sober River, I said, is about bodhicitta primarily. It's very much in the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism. And Reflections, uh, Trackless Path is about Dzogchen, Mahamudra, direct awareness, that aspect of Buddhism. And in between the two, uh, there's this book, uh, Magic of Vajrayana, which is the one we're going to talk about this evening. And uh, it's also deceptive. Now, the relationship between these three books is that uh, Reflections on Silver River, the Mahayana, is the base. And uh, Vajrayana is not actually a separate tradition. It's just a form of Vajrayana, a very special form. Uh, but it assumes that you know the material that's in Reflections on Silver River or that comparable book like the Jewel Ornament of Liberation or whatever uh, pretty well. And then you enter into Vajrayana practice, which I say is a special form of Mahayana. <coughs> and Vajrayana is primarily a purification practice. Uh, whether you're doing deity practice or the advanced uh, energy transformation practices, uh, which is what kind of characterizes Vajrayana. It's about purification. And you say, well, what am I being, what's being purified? And I found that the best way to say this in English, rather than transpose Tibetan, is that you are purifying, or we could say equally valid uh, validly, emptying your experience of life of any personal investment. Now why would you do that? You would do that because it is the personal investment of life in your life that gives rise to all the struggles that you have, all the struggles that we have. Because when we're personally invested in something, we try to hold on to it. And it's the nature of all experience to pass. Basic lesson in impermanence. So holding on to anything puts us immediately into a struggle with life. That's where it all comes from. So. I'm going to begin this, <coughs> as my school suggested, <coughs> reading three sections, short sections. The book is basically built around the way Vajrayana is organized. Guru, deity, protector. Guru is a special form of teacher. And the specialness is that uh, a guru has the ability to transmit or demonstrate or reveal in some way my nature, you know, what we actually are. <coughs> a lot of different ways that can happen. We may stumble across some tonight, maybe. The central practice in Vajrayana is teacher union joining your mind with the teachers. And the central or the key method 
in that practice is actually prayer. But when I was sitting down to write this book, I went, it's very interesting. In all the years I've studied this stuff, nobody's ever talked about how to pray. They talked how, about how to have devotion, talked about faith, talked about all kinds of things. Nobody's ever talked about how to pray. And yet prayer became something quite important for me. Uh, and now, with a, I would like to say, a more fuller understanding of this tradition, I would say it's one of the key, one of the core components of it. And a lot of people, when they, especially in the West, when they think about meditation practice, they don't think about prayer. But that's a kind of a problem, and uh, one that I think we're only just beginning to engage in any depth in our culture now. So I'm going to begin with a prayer. Treasured teacher, I pray to you. Give me energy to let belief in self fall away. Give me energy to see through life's illusions. Give me energy to let reactive thinking end. Give me energy to know mind has no beginning. Give me energy to let confusion resolve itself. Give me energy to know that life is empty presence. This prayer spoke, has always spoken to me. I have said it literally hundreds of thousands of times. Even today, when I do teacher union practice, this is the prayer I turn to. And just as I have done for decades, I go to the edge of the world I know, and I reach out. That, for me, is the essence of prayer to go to the edge of what I know and reach out to the unknown. I pray to my teacher, but of what I'm reaching out to is more than a person. I'm reaching out to what I yearn to know or experience what is exemplified in my teacher. My nature, direct awareness, whatever you want to call it. In reaching out, I take a step towards that which is beyond what I know. Now, what is deceptive about this book is that the English isn't difficult. I think everybody could understand the words there. But uh, there are layers and layers of meaning in this. Layers which usually only reveal themselves through practice. How many of you know a book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind? Oh. Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind is such a book. And you can read it and think, oh, that's very helpful. Yeah, I know. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Hmm? And then for one reason or another, you come back to it five, maybe ten years later, and you go, huh, I thought I understood that, but that, that's, that's quite different. It's not that your previous understanding was wrong, but now the book has revealed something quite different. I had a dramatic experience of this. <coughs> Many years ago, I, uh, one of my students was a uh, manager of an investment fund, handled a uh, quarter of a billion dollars. And uh, I met him at a wedding 
And he said, I'm going on, a, and he was introduced by a mutual friend of ours, and, and said, I'm very interested in talking more with you, Ken, but I'm going on a business trip tomorrow. Is there a book you could recommend that I take? I said, sure. Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Six months later, he came back from his business trip, and called me, and went over to his apartment. I said, I cannot understand why you recommended that book. It didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. He was actually a little angry with me. And I said, okay, let's just put that aside for the time being. And so I gave him his first meditation instruction. And about nine months later, he said, I'm going on a, another business trip. Uh, I'd like you to recommend a book. I said, well, you may take this the wrong way, but I'm going to recommend you take Send Mind, Beginner's Mind. He sort of gave me a very serious look and uh, said, okay, if it's not what you think, then I'll take it. A few months later, I got a phone call. That's the most fantastic book. I want to get a dozen copies immediately and give a difference. <laughs> so that's a good book, and you want to find those kinds of books. Next section is from deity practice. This is probably the most complex aspect of Tibetan Buddhism, one which has uh, confounded many people for over many, many years. Some people take to it very naturally. Other people struggle with it terribly. Other people just throw up their hands and say, I can't make head or tail of it. And there are many reasons for that, not the least of which is that it comes from a different culture and a different time. And I'm not going to try and convey all of that to you this evening, but I'm just going to read one of the ways that deity practice affected me. Meditation on death and impermanence led me to understand that everything I experience is transitory. <clears throat> but such understanding was largely conceptual. It didn't go deep. The understanding that came through deity practice was deeper. Before I even took birth as a deity, I had to die albeit symbolically. Then I took birth as the deity, lived life as the deity, and then died as the deity. In each practice session, everything I was, everything I felt, and everything I thought I knew dissolved into nothing. And I took birth as the deity. At the end of each session, I died as the deity. And ev everything that I am, everything I feel, and everything I know arose again out of nothing. Day after day, month after month, year after year, I engaged that cycle. It changed how I saw life. I saw through, at least in part, the enchantments all of us live under, the illusory reality of sensory experience, of emotions, of transcendent experiences, and of control. The last section that I'm going to read 
is from protector practice. Now, <clears throat> in the Tibetan tradition, you have deities or yidams, which is the Tibetan word, and you have protectors. The Sanskrit is dharmapala. And they're regarded as two different kinds of deities. In the Vajrayana tradition of Japan, Shingon, there's no distinction made between Yidams and protectors. And as I came to understand things more deeply, there's really a spectrum here that starts with the emptiness of my nature and goes through the teacher to the deity to the protector, more and more solid in a certain sense. But it's a spectrum, and they aren't really sharp divisions. But the emphasis in practice is a little different. And in uh, though they all of them share these common features, I th it's fair to say that in the uh, practice of uh, protector practice, which is arguably the closest to uh, the ancient sorcery traditions. The three main aspects of practice are ritual, performance of ritual, which is very much about magic, sacrifice, and submission. And this is from the sacrifice section. When you take up protector practice, you are implicitly acknowledging that you do not control your life and that your conscious conceptual understanding does not know what you need to wake up. From that point on, what happens in your life is, in a certain sense, irrelevant. You have chosen to, or being chosen, to enter a mystery. And it is up to you to live in it. Your commitment is to living awake. If it takes a nightmare to shake you loose from your entanglement with reactive patterns and conceptual confusion, your life may become a nightmare. My second three-year retreat and what followed was one such nightmare. As I mentioned earlier, one of the effects of retreat practice was a serious energy imbalance that weakened me physically and mentally for many years. But that was only part of the picture. Stubborn, arrogant, unfeeling in ways that are embarrassing to acknowledge today, contemptuous of a body that I saw simply as a vehicle for mystical pursuit. I thought I knew what I was doing and what was best for me. The protectors did what I charged them to do. They created the conditions I needed to wake up. They stripped away my health, my sense of capability, my pride, my reliance on intellectual understanding, and my self-respect. They shut down any possibility of intensive retreat practice and cut me off from practicing, practicing almost all the methods I had learned. And they exiled me to a small desert town in California called Los Angeles. I was left with no choice. I had to change. I had to find a completely different approach to life and to spiritual practice. It was not easy and it took a long time. I do not look back on those times with joy. 
but at the same time I am grateful. I'm not sure that anything else would have led me to change. Thanks for those selections, Ken. So uh, we're now going to do some, uh, we'll have a, a talk and ev then eventually open it up to Q&A with you all. Um, where are we at here? Yes. Okay. Thank you for reading those again. I, really appreciate I asked him to do that. So deep appreciation. And you know, it occurs to me that there's uh, so many things we already talked about in our interview, several interviews, you know, maybe like four interviews, uh, but At particularly, least, yeah. but particularly about this book, two interviews, and and so many things we talked about just one on one. Um, but you know, the first thing that that's up around this Adriana topic around the book today is that based on the interviews that we, we did and other interviews um, that you've done and also subsequent ones that I have done, there's a lot of um, people who have not done uh, Vajrayana practice before who now want to, you know, engage in some aspects of Vajrayana practice. And oftentimes, um, uh, not through a tradition necessarily, but they just want to start trying it out. You know, it's a very, very uh, uh, Western way of working with it. And you know, the it's not that they're, uh, at least the sense I'm getting from the people I'm talking to, it's not simply uh, trivial. They, they do, you know, these are deep practitioners who want to engage, but they just want to, you know, like dip their toe in the water. Um, but it, as I'm talking to them, there, there's an aspect of it that I recognize from myself from a while ago um, that is, it's just, it's not like unsavory or disturbing or any, anything like that, but it's just a little bit of a like, uh, you know, like a, a little bit of a sense of um, that might not be that good of a thing to bring to it. And it's the sense that it's, um, you know, the, the short word would be like orientalist or something where it's like it's foreign and really weird and you're worshiping a demon. And it, it's got this kind of forbidden coolness aspect. And, you know, uh, it's not obviously connected to anything that we, um, any of our uh, sort of cultural troubles that we're used to in Western culture thinking about. Like it's kind of separate from that in this fantasy way or something. And again, I'm not saying this to criticize people because it's, I'm just highlighting it. And I'm curious, you know, how you, what, how you would talk to someone coming at it from that angle to work, you know, again, not in a, a harsh way, but to, just to sort of tackle that particular view, because I see it coming up a lot. I think this is a very important question. In the last excerpt that I uh, read, I, uh, I think you can hear that one of the things that I was struggling with there was letting go of the idea that I controlled my life. And we grow up in a culture in which we are taught from a very, very early age that uh, we control our lives. And if you can't make your life manifest the way you want, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, this approach to life has several drawbacks. One of them is that it tends to eliminate the role of chance or downplay the role of chance in your life. And chance has played a huge role in my life. The train of events which led me to my teacher began, though I didn't know it, with one of my roommates at university. He was Iranian, a uh, Zarathustran, and a uh, good guy, studying engineering. But through him, I ended up at his brother's campsite outside Tehran, where I heard about a Buddhist mission on the outskirts of Delhi that was a low-cost place to stay because I didn't have much money, where I met a Dutch nun, Buddhist nun, who told me about Kala Rinpoche my teacher, and that as a Canadian, I was eligible for a special kind of visa that allowed me to stay in Darjeeling area for six months at a time. That was the train of events that led me to my teacher. So how much chance is there in that? And when I went into business consulting, it was a similar train. So. If you're serious about spiritual practice, no, let's not even start there. Let's not start there. What is spiritual practice about? Well, one of the things that I've come to understand, it's about many things. It's not about just one thing. There's a wonderful movie called Bab Aziz, that's B-A-B-A-Z-I-Z. -I, I think you can rent it on Amazon. Used to be able to anyway. Its subtitle is The Prince Who Contemplated His Soul. And uh, it's about a grandfather or a, an old man and his granddaughter, I think it's granddaughter, and their journey to a gathering of mystics somewhere. And very early on in the movie, it says there are many paths to God as there are souls in the universe. Now, <coughs> there's another book that I s recommend reading, and I recommend it because it is a very clear exposition of the problems of belief. It's called The Religious Case Against Belief, and it's by an individual called James Carse, C-A-R-S-E. <coughs> and in this book, since he's going to be talking about religion, he says, well, what is a religion? And he offers the following definition of a religion. A religion is a centuries-long conversation about a certain question. And he offers this definition to explain why it is impossible to understand a religion from the outside. You're either part of the conversation or you're not. And one of the things that I've come to appreciate is that the questions that call 
to you from your heart need to be listened very, very carefully. And you may have to listen to them for a very long time before you can even put them into words. And then you seek out the traditions or the teachings that are engaged in that conversation. Now in Buddhism, the question is very simple. It's exemplified in the life of Buddha. How do you live at peace in a world shaped by old age, illness, and death? That was what called the Buddha. That's what led him to give up his family, his wife and child, his position, everything. Because he could not understand how that was possible. Other religions are about other questions. They aren't all about the same question. So, rather than looking for a meditation technique or something that interests you, look at what's moving you in that direction and listen to that. Because the answers that you formulate before you really listen to that they're shaped and forged by all kinds of stuff that is just garbage, actually, in our lives. As you will learn if you pursue this path. So you just sit quietly. Go and sit by a river for a few days. Or by the ocean. Or in the forests. We're very fortunate here in California because we can do all of that. And, uh, and listen. Listen as deeply as you can. For you have to take Rilke's warning <coughs> seriously. Letters to a young poet. We don't have the poet's letters. We just have Rilke's responses. But at one point, Rilke says... If you can live your life without being a poet, go and do so. But if in the small hours of the morning, there's a stammering voice in you that insists on being a poet, and you cannot find peace unless you listen to that voice, then this is how you do it. And I would say the same here. Listen to that voice inside. Listen to it as deeply as you're able to. And then listen to it a little bit more. And then take your direction from there. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. I think it does. <laughs> uh, exactly. Uh, so we'll go at it from another direction. <laughs> I, I'm curious if you would describe what it was like for, you know, like a young Canadian mathematician to encounter deity yoga from this, you know, incredible master at first. Uh. Why stick it at first? <laughs> uh, something had called to me while I was still an undergraduate. Actually, I can say it's earlier than that. I can probably say it was some time around when I was 10 or 11. Uh, maybe even earlier than that, I don't know. 
but I had read a certain number of Christian theologians. Some of them might have been mystics. Uh, but this was in the 60s, and there wasn't in Canada. And it was there wasn't a lot about mysticism around then. Uh, I heard about such Zen books as the Blue Cliff Record, but I had no idea how to get hold of a copy of it. Uh, but one thing led to another, and uh, I uh, gave up a scholarship to do graduate work in England and to, as it was a 60s thing to do, hit the road. Mm -hmm. I had to do it a little differently. I did it on a bicycle, mm -hmm. which was a little grueling at times. And uh, eventually ended up by this very strange series of happenstances that I related before, not looking for deity practice, just going to Kala Rinpoche's monastery because he was a respected teacher and I wanted to learn something about meditation because I thought it had something to do with mysticism. And uh, when I first walked up to the monastery, I walked up some steps, um, there is a statue, or sorry, a, a reliquary, a chorten, stupa, uh, and I started to walk around it counterclockwise. And there were some people coming towards me, and they went, no, 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 no. And I didn't know what they were doing. They were Tibetans. And I, and I started to walk a bit more. No, 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 no. And they made sure that I walked around it clockwise. Okay. I had no idea why. And... Uh, I learned later that it was a sign of disrespect, deep disrespect in Tibetan Buddhism to point your left shoulder at a holy object. So you walk around clockwise. So your right shoulder is pointed at. And, uh, and that comes from Indian lore, I learned still later. So I wasn't really looking for deity practice. I was looking for methods that would lead me to some kind of mystical understanding. And I simply accepted what my teacher gave me. And one of the first things he gave me was a deity practice, which I couldn't relate to at all. I mean, I had no idea what to do with it. It didn't make any sense to me. Uh, and then I heard about this set of practices which uh, sounded like something I might be able to do. It's, what, it's called Mundro. You've probably heard about that. And uh, I had to request those teachings several times before my teacher gave them, because he'd given them to a number of other Westerners, and they hadn't done anything with them, so he was thought that didn't work. But eventually he gave them to me. And then I had to learn Tibetan and translate the text, because there was nothing in English. Uh, many years later, let's say uh, 10 years later, after the first three-year retreat, I remember the group of us, and we'd done those practices, and we'd done three years in which you'd learned probably 150, 200 different meditation techniques, an awful lot. Like, three-year retreat is really like graduate school for contemplation. And a tremendous amount of material which you have to digest in one way or another. And he said, you know, way back when, when he first started with Rinpoche, he gave us this deity, Chenrei Zi, Avalokiteshvara. And he said, everything's contained here. And you know, he's right. We didn't need to do all this. <laughs> and uh, that's what you begin to see all the time. So... I wasn't, it, this wasn't something I was seeking out. It was what was given to me, and it took me a long time to figure out how to relate to it. 
and uh, one of the things I'm actually very grateful for is understanding what extraordinary methods of practice these are. Uh, they're not for everybody, but if they fit with you and uh, you're willing to take them on with all that that's involved, they really are quite extraordinary. So th that's sort of how you ended up, you know, encountering it and, and learning how to work with it. Um, and something that you unpack in the book rather well uh, is to me, of course, and I think for a lot of people, the big question, which is uh, Vajrayana practice has its, you know, this is magic. That's why magic is in the title, right? It's not just a, it's not a metaphor. No. This is a magical practices that have their roots in actual shamanism and sorcery and yeah. uh, 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 with spells and, and, you know, ritual objects. And it's, it's, uh, literal sorcery and you know isn't this what we left behind and what is this you know and, and, and what does this possibly have to offer us that is a very broad question I mean, in a, in a way, the question is, you know, about why this way, rather than what it's going to give me, but more about, like, this is a, a very unusual way of, of going about spirituality now, at least for most people in the West. There are a lot of difficulties here. Uh, the way it's come to the West, uh, the way the West has evolved over the last thousand years, 1500 years. Uh, yeah, I'd say those are the two main things. The way that we have evolved, in, or Western society has evolved, and the way that uh, this tradition comes to us now. For the first, as I was working on this book, I came to appreciate in a very, very small way something that I hadn't appreciated before. We have no idea what it is like to live in a cultural milieu which has not been disrupted or broken by upheavals, whether they be war, famine, whatever, for three or four thousand years. That's what India is. I mean, people would come in and they would conquer and there would be wars. But the Indian subcontinent was so rich in so many religions. And people could move around. And, you know, a lot of India is flat and you can walk. Uh, it, and there are hills in some places, but you can move around in it. And so if you ended up at, in a tradition which wasn't working for you for whatever reason, it was the wrong question or what have you, then you went and studied with somebody else and so forth, and you could do this. And there were so many different religions. See, there isn't any such thing as Hinduism, or at least it's a very modern invention. When the British ethnographers started studying India seriously in the 18th, more in the 19th, they went, hmm, those are Sikhs, yes, okay. And those are giants. And, and there's Buddhism somewhere around here. 
Uh, what's all that? Oh, we'll just call it all Hinduism. That's where Hinduism came from. But it's not how it was. What Vajrayana today in the Tibetan tradition consists of is at least 19 sets of practices, deities, which in their own time were complete religions in their own right. And what is called a tantra now were the sacred texts associated with that deity and those practices. And that existed in that form and still does. I mean, you still have cult of Kali and Shiva and so forth. And those are really traditions in their own right. And there's Brahmanism and uh, Vishnu. These are, these are actually different religions. They've just been grouped together by colonial forces, basically. And, uh, and gradually, these traditions which were rich in magic, as you well know uh, from your own studies, uh, they intermingled and interacted with each other and came together. And Tibetans would come from Tibet and study with these teachers and would take back hundreds of texts and then would sit down and study and work in hundreds of practices, like Marpa the Translator and Chungpa Naljur and uh, other ones I can't remember, but many, many, many translators. And all of these things mixed together and interacted with each other. There, in, in my own tradition, there are two practices. One's called Laji Drildrup, which means four deities rolled together. And it actually has five deities in it, but it has these five figures, which in their, you know, a few hundred years earlier would have been five separate religions. And then there's another one, which is, has another five deities. It's called the five tantric deities, uh, all major tantras. Uh, so, we ha so you have an unbroken line from shamanism to formation of mystical cults, the formation of actual institutional religions, coming and going over hundreds, if not thousands of years. And, uh, and that's what happened to Buddhism in India. Eventually it got lost in the shuffle of the shuffling. It became indistinguishable from all the rest. Uh, but Tibet brought it out and preserved it in a way that it didn't last in India. And in our culture, it's been very, very different. Uh, Judaism experienced the destruction of the temple, which meant that they had to come up with a completely different approach to practice. And that gave rise to, from, moved from the priestly tradition of Judaism into the rabbinical tradition of Judaism. Uh, we went through the Reformation, which, you know, there was one church until Martin Luther, and then 20 years after Martin Luther, there were hundreds, literally, of Protestant sects. And there's incredible destruction. Then through the complete destruction of the mystical basis of Western culture through Henry VIII and uh, Emperor Joseph a couple of hundred years later, did the same thing on the continent that Henry VIII did in England, destroyed all of the village churches and the monasteries, which is where the monks uh, and nuns hung out who were deeply mystical. And th so our, our whole religious history has been terribly disturbed and agitated by this, the way that Indian done. So it's, it's a very, very different world. And, uh, and when you're stepping into something like Vajrayana, that's what you're stepping into. And it's, uh, I found, and I think all of us in the three-year retreat found that we really just had to let go of everything we thought we understood about religion and let this material speak to us. And I'll say for myself, I did the, came out of second three-year retreat in 1983, but it was pretty well, not for another 20 years that I really let go of my Western conception of religion. 
uh, it took a long time to get that out of my head. Uh, because the conception that we have of religion and magic and everything in our, cult in our culture is actually incredibly narrow and very fragmented. So it's good to learn some of this other stuff. It gives you a different perspective. Very good. So at this point, let's open it up sure. to, to the group. And uh, we'll, if you have a question for Ken, uh, raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. Yep. And you can ask. <laughs> have you spoken about um, I say it what Julian Trumpa said, genuine heart of sadness. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I know what word he was translating there. It's usually translated as renunciation. It's, uh, that was uh, borrowing it from a Western monastic model of being a, becoming a renunciate. Mm -hmm. uh, some time ago, well, I'll speak more personally. I never felt that I was a renunciate. No, I gave up a lot of things. I gave up a career in mathematics. You know, I gave up a lot of other stuff. But it, for me, my pursuit of spiritual practice uh, was not about leaving things behind. And as I've intimated in some of what I've said already, I, like a lot of people on such a path, I encountered a lot of difficulty. And more than a few people, very well-meaning, said to me, well, why didn't you stop? And this question was posed to me enough times that I had to give it very serious thought. Why didn't I? And I examined myself as deeply as I was capable of, you know, was spiritual practice some psychological compensation mechanism? Was I trying to avoid something? <coughs> or was it because of some other things in my life? Well, maybe, but none of that seemed, didn't ring true. And I went through this process over a course of several years. And every time I went through it again, I was always faced with the fact that the idea of stopping had never occurred to me. I was at that point, I thought that renunciation isn't the right word here. Uh, I think the right word in English is calling. You feel something calls to you. Uh, and uh, that feels far more congruent with my experience than renunciation. Now, there's a sadness in the calling because it's calling you to a path. And most of your friends and most of your family, they're not going to ever understand why you did this. Shall I tell you a little personal story about me? So at the end of the first three-year retreat, and I'd had difficulty in the first three-year retreat, my wife at that time had done the woman's retreat. And it became very clear to us as the first retreat was winding down that uh, 
Rinpoche was going to send us to be teachers at different centers. You know. And neither Ingrid, my ex-wife, and or I wanted to teach. So we asked Rinpoche if we could do a second three-year retreat, uh, which he was actually, when we walked in to his room to ask to make this, for this request formally, it was like walking in, in which, to a room in which the air was made of gold. And uh, so we did. Now, my parents had come over from Canada. We were in France, uh, which is where the retreat place was, and uh, to bring us back to Canada. And uh, they'd come to greet us when you came out of the retreat, then gone to visit some, other, some relatives, and then they came back, and we told them that we were going to do a th second three-year retreat. <laughs> my parents were not happy. My father was definitely not happy. He said, well, we were going to speak with Rinpoche about this. He knew Rinpoche from before. And, uh, and then Ingrid and I went on a kind of vacation with them. Uh, and it was very interesting. My mother, some time later, told me that even though he didn't ever understand what we were doing, he felt there was something very, very good about it. And so he came to peace of it himself. I was very glad to hear that. But when you have that calling, don't expect anybody to come with you. Uh, loneliness is one of the aspects of this path. And uh, the sadness has many dimensions. Uh, there's sadness about the leaving behind, but there's a deeper sadness. And the sadness is actually about compassion. Because here I can only speak for Buddhism, but I'm sure it holds in different ways in other traditions. As you come to understand what the source of suffering is. The more compassion arises in your heart, it's impossible for it to be otherwise. Why? Because as you explore your own struggles with life, you see that everybody else struggles with life for actually the same reasons, maybe different circumstances, but it's the same confusion and mess. And as you begin to understand this in yourself and you get a little bit clearer, you understand how it's the same in other people, and it just hurts. It just hurts. Okay? Thank you. Hi, Ken. Hi. Uh, I had a question on prayer. Uh, ah. The one, it was a beautiful prayer you, you gave an example of. Um, and it was directed at a guru? Um, or you, you, you direct it to your teacher. Teacher. Your, guru, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but your teacher is not only the union of all of the teachers you ever have had and ever will have, but also of everything it means to be enlightened or awake or whatever okay. you want to call it. And, but it's not that, you see, we, we've, 
We don't have any experience in our lives with living symbols. We don't have any experience for the last 125 years in our culture, at least, of um, being able to uh, function mythically, uh, to, to live uh, mythically in life. We can only live rationally. And, and so, it, and Vajrayana, as it was practiced in Tibet, uh, is a culture before that split happened. And uh, everybody in the culture, really, moves between the rational and the mythic with great ease. And uh, the rational I'm talking about is how we navigate life. The technical term for it is logos. And the mythic is what gives meaning to life. But what gives meaning to life cannot be put into words. Yeah. And, and so you can only talk about it with the language of poetry and metaphor. And we've lost the ability to do that. And this is what Nietzsche and others were decrying. That's why he said, God is dead. And, and we still have not, in my op opinion, we have not recovered from the shock of the Reformation, which is 500 years now. Uh, and so th we, we've lost that. And I like to think that I've recovered it a little bit through my efforts. I know other people who are far more fluid in it than I am, and it's, uh, but it tends to degenerate into naive superstition or uh, a, a, a rather childish uh, approach to life when it's not. I mean, my teacher just had different ways of making decisions, and he used signs, and he, if somebody came to him, he would often give them a task. And it might be a difficult task, it might be an easy task. And you see what they did with it. And if it was a, uh, if they completed it, he took it as a sign that he could trust them. And if they didn't complete it, it didn't matter how intelligent, how capable, what connections, how wealthy or whatever, he didn't trust them. He followed the signs. That's a magical or a mythical approach to life. And there were just numerous examples of that kind of thing. So when you're praying, you're moving into a mythic world. And it, it doesn't function the same way. It doesn't function literally, you know, the way that we're used to interpreting everything. And people get so hung up on that. Do deities exist? Well, of course they do. Well, look at all the pictures. Yeah. But, it's, but when you move into the mythic world, it's not about existence and non-existence. It's about how you experience things. Right. And this is another very deep division. You know, Western society is largely ontologically based. Most of the Eastern, Eastern traditions are epistemologically based. It's about how you experience life, not about what life is. And these are all things that I had to learn. <laughs> yeah. Did that answer your question? Or is it yeah, too much? Yeah, pretty much. So, uh, just a couple. Um, so, it, it doesn't have to be directed at a guru necessarily, or um, Michael's my guru, but he doesn't instantiate as a guru. So, um, I have no guru. Yeah, really. but it's not up to him. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Oops. <Right. laughs> so, so, I can just, uh, I, I go with the experience. Are, are there any, uh, just I'm, I'm new to prayer, so um, are there any, is there a book you could recommend that has a, a selection of uh, prayers that are good? Uh, oh, maybe. sure, but they're not in English. They're not in English, <laughs> okay. okay. And I mean, there's, uh, there's thousands and thousands of prayers okay. in the Tibetan tradition. Find, no. Say here. They gotta be in good English. They gotta speak to you. They have a lot of brilliant translators, but they can't write. It doesn't matter how well 
you understand what the prayer says. If you can't write in English, you can't write it in a way that's going to move people. And uh, I don't know what to do about that. It's a source of great... I mean, I, I try very hard in my own translations to tr translate in such a way that it actually speaks to people. And that's what to look for. Okay. Something that speaks to you. Okay. You have a question over there? Um, I first wanted to thank you for the article um, When Energy Runs Wild because it saved me when I was in some deep shit. So well, I'm very glad it. to hear that. Yeah. Um, my question is, what's the deal with finding a teacher? It seems impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say that? Um, so I was introduced to your work via David Chapman. Yes. Um, and David and, and Charlie's writing and then your writing have... Uh, and um, Nagpa Chogyam uh, from the Arrow Lineage uh, have all laid out something very lovely. It seems very lovely, and they're like, but you have to find a teacher <laughs> first. <laughs> and, and no, I'm not going to be your teacher, whoever the author of the book is. Um, may and I, may I call them. <laughs> 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 um, and if you go to a, a different teacher and you point to that book, they don't know what you're talking about. Um, and maybe there's a <laughs> trip to, to India to do, um, but for those of us who, who aren't going to India, uh, I'm stuck. <laughs> no, you're not. When I was doing business consulting, I developed a cross-functional mini departments group, which actually I developed that group in 2003, and I had supper with or dinner with uh, my main contact, who had long since retired. And she had just received a phone call or an email that morning from someone in that group saying, this group, we had our last meeting yesterday. So this group lasted 20 years. <laughs> One of the things that I insisted on them, they would say, I can't do that. I can't do that. I'm stuck. And I would listen to what they're saying. And they would say, no, all you're describing are features in the landscape of your life. They're real. You have to figure out how to navigate those features. If you take the, f you know, there's a stone there, and there's a wide river there, and there's a mountain there, and maybe there's a bunch of wild animals over there. Okay, that's what it is. Maybe there's a pit over there. That's your life. Now, how do you navigate to get where you want to go? Now you can feel right now, I can tell what that's, that's working in you. And you're also feeling what it may cost. That's part of it. That's good. You got it. Whether you like it or not. It's <laughs> good, really. Keep that. That's your guide. The other thing I'll say, we think about the teacher, the teacher, the teacher. No. It doesn't matter what discipline, you know, whether it's basketball, violin, medicine. There are three things you need. You need someone, and it may be several someones who can reveal possibilities to you. And I've just revealed a possibility to you. Right? You also need someone or several someones to teach you how to develop the skills and the capacities you're going to need. If you're playing basketball, you need someone who can teach you how to shoot and how to dribble, and how to fake, and how to 
the block, right? And you need to develop the strength so that you can stand and people are going to bounce off you rather than run you over. <laughs> things like that. You need the same kinds of things in spiritual practice. And the third thing you need, you need someone who can point out when your own stuff's getting in the way. That's really important. Now, you may find all three in one person, and you may develop a very close relationship with such a person. It can be a very, very deep relationship. And then when people are talking about teaching, that's what they're talking about. But you may find them in different people. There's a Lama in England who told me about there was a certain teacher that he desperately wanted to meet. I won't, the story's a bit long. I won't go into all the details. In the end, I like it, the small hours of the morning, he was summoned and he entered this teacher's room and he was just bursting with questions. But in Tibetan protocol, you don't speak until you're spoken by the senior person. And this teacher never spoke to him. And after about 10 minutes, the teacher motioned for him to leave. And he went back to his room. And he was just actually heartbroken. The only chance he had, and he couldn't say a word. He couldn't ask a single question. And basically, he cried himself to sleep. He woke up in the morning. The other teacher had left. And he sat down to meditate. And his meditation was completely different. It's the only interaction he ever had with that teacher, but he regards them as one of his most profound teachers. So you have no idea where this is going to come from or how. It's up to you. Okay. So Vince, you had a question? Thank you. Um, I have a question about achievement. Mm. Um, in the months before reading your book, I was finding it to be qualitatively more empty. So there were some nice things about this. I did some new things I wouldn't have done before. But sometimes if I think about it, I also feel unbearably small and pointless. And so the practice suggested in the book was, you know, has already been surprising, if not helpful, um, in resting and recognizing. And I was wondering, as I continue to do this practice, if you could please say something about the view I should hold. This goes back to something I was saying earlier. Feel free to chime in, by the way. Uh, about being clear about the questions that you're holding in your heart. They're your questions. They aren't anybody else's. And uh, the comparing mind is a very difficult mind. In the uh, Theravadan tradition, the comparing mind is only let go at the last stage of arhatship. It's similar in the Tibetan, in the um, Mahayana Bodhisattva, I think. It's like ninth or tenth. It's a very, very high level Bodhisattva. Uh, it's insidious, but it's also very useful from a survival point of view. That's why it's so deeply ingrained in us. Uh, and achievement is very much connected with the comparing mind. Hold the questions in your heart and you keep practicing until the questions are no longer there. What other people are doing doesn't matter at all. I've learned this to some extent. I won't say I've learned it completely, but I know that that's the path now. You want to add anything? Okay. How 
we doing for time? About a half hour, but we can still go. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm fine. And if you wanted to, you know, maybe in your corner, just go. Yes. On the chapter on uh, deity practice, you mention speaking a spell, and that spell being I am empty, timeless awareness. And then several paragraphs later, you mention um, not approaching deity practice conceptually, um, dropping visualization, dropping conceptual approaches. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that, because, okay. Um, I, are you recommending from the beginning to approach it in that way, or is that something that develops organically as, because uh, most of the beginning advice is to visualize the deity, yeah. and it struck me when I read that. Well, Do you know what you do when you think? Well, there's the answer. You don't. <laughs> None of us do. It, it, it's something that happens, right? That's my Wittgenstein influence showing. Sorry. Uh, but we don't. In fact, I mean, Wittgenstein goes further. He says, we don't actually know what we're going to say until the words come out of our mouth. And how many of you have the experience where you think you're going to say this, and when you open your mouth, something else comes out? <laughs> sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's a little embarrassing. So I'm not at all sure what the Tibetan word that is translated as visualizing. I'm no longer sure what it means. I really don't know. Because I don't know what Tibetans are doing. What, what the I do not know what that word means to Tibetans. And they can talk about this. I mean, you can talk to say, well, when I think I do this and this and this. But actually, that's usually not what we're doing when we're thinking. <laughs> it's what we might like to think we're doing, but it's not what we're doing. And so, I know many people, including myself, have a great deal of difficulty with visualizing. Uh, I know other people for whom they're able to create whole worlds just extraordinarily easily and very precisely. So there's a huge spectrum here. And I'm just, whenever I come across a spectrum, and a translation favors one portion of that spectrum, my suspicions go up that there's something wrong with the translation. Do you follow? Because I, I, I don't think the word that's being used is meant to exclude such a large number of people. And so that's what led me to rethink this at all. Now, I want to do two exercises, and you're the guinea pig, but everybody else can participate. So, do you have any acquaintance with deity practice? Okay, so, Chenrezig, okay, we'll take Chenrezig. Avalokiteshvara, for those of you who are more comfortable in Sanskrit, Kuan Yin, for those who like Japanese uh, Chinese, uh, white deity, four arms, embodiment of awakened compassion, uh, clothed in silks and jewels. So visualize yourself as Chenrezig. What does that feel like? You've had enough time. What's it like? Yeah, but 
I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about right now. What was it like right now? Yeah. Vague sense of something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Fuzzy, white, something. Right. Not very clear. Yeah. How conscious were you of yourself? I'm visualizing. How conscious were you? Yeah, quite definite. Okay, I'd like you to try another one, okay? Instead of visualizing, imagine you are Avalokiteshvara. What's your experience there? But still a little separation? Yeah. Okay. So I'd like you to try something. Everything comes in threes, you know. <laughs> right now, be generation. What was that like? What's that? Speak up, please. Yeah. Say more. What happened? Difficult to put into words? A bit more than that. Go ahead. Katie, can you give me a microphone? I guess that's one of the reasons I asked the question is um, uh, When I read that, it, it gave me pause because it's something that's been happening more and more often. Um. So, there's a lot of confusion about what is the deity. Now, in the Tibetan tradition, The deity is the union of compassion and emptiness. That's what the deity is. <coughs> now, compassion and emptiness can take an awful lot of forms. So there's a lot of deities. So the, the deity <coughs> is compassion and emptiness. When you say this <coughs> mantra, the spell, you break the enchantment of experiencing a subject, a self, that is separate from the world out there. Mm -hmm. That's the enchantment under which we all live. The purpose of that spell is to break that enchantment. Does so for only a microsecond or two. And when I asked you to be Chen Rizhi, that was a little more powerful spell. So I broke it for a little longer. Mm -hmm. You felt it. Okay. That is the seed of what you experienced right there is the seed 
which becomes the deity. So if that isn't present in your practice, then you're not doing it. And you're going to come back to that again and again and again. And it's, and it's going to be nurtured through your practice. Where that will evolve to, how it will evolve, I can't possibly say. Um, um, <laughs> there are moments where, well, there are sessions where visualization is easy, right? Mm -hmm. And then there are some where you're struggling. But what's happening more and more often, I find, is that regardless of whether the visualizations come easier or not, there is a certainty of presence. I was struggling to articulate that before, but that's where it's almost like a sense of faith. Like there's a certainty that Chinrezig is before me, me, and I think that's what you were getting at, and I guess that's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask the question. Yeah. So when that sense of certainty arises, don't try to hold on to it. That will be problematic. But learn to rest in it, which is very different from holding on to it. It will come and it will go. And that's, uh, but you're, you're absolutely correct that when you feel that, something that we call faith arises. And that, that itself is rather difficult to put into words. Because it's, it's not about a clinging of any kind. It's more about... Uh, an openness, but an openness that re rests in something you're describing as a certainty. Uh, you could almost say it's solid, even though there's nothing there that is solid. Do you follow? Yeah. And that's what you're cultivating in this practice. And you learn to live your life from there. Not trying to bring it into your life and make it like it's some toolbox or something like that. You actually learn to live your life from there in the same way that you be Chen Does this make sense to you? Good. Thank you. You're welcome. A couple of questions over here. Now, did anybody else get anything out of that exercise? Okay, just checking. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, you seem to have um, rethought a lot of these concepts and techniques, and I'm, I'm very curious to get your, um, your experience on um, sort of the more traditional path of shamatha, vipassana, and sort of mastering these before moving into complete, you know, creation, completion stages, let alone Mahamudra and Zogchen, and how you sort of, how you, you seem to have a new, a different understanding. Then. It's certainly not new. <laughs> 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 Look, there's, uh, you have Sutriana and Vajrayana. Well, I'm, uh, the, the idea that you're kind of an empty, you're a pot with a hole in it if you haven't sort of mastered your Shamatha and Vipassana. And you won't, you know. Yeah. You won't. You will never get to cutting through or. There's sutriana and there's vajrayana. Uh, sutriana is uh, that's what reflections on Silver River is about. Uh, one of the best uh, in my in my own tradition. Uh, the path of meditation in Sutriyana is uh, Aspirations of Mahamudra. You find a trans it's been translated many times, so find a translation on my website. Uh, 
and that's the path. Uh, you follow, basically it's part of Lamrim, you know, progressive stages, you know, uh, cultivate the four measurables and uh, bodhicitta, and provide a basis for, or in conjunction with that shamatha, and as shamatha becomes somewhat stable, uh, resting, say resting with the breath, for instance, then the pashna seeing into nature of mind becomes possible, and then those are enhanced through the practice of Mahamudra brought together. And, uh, and that is a path. Uh, goes back basically to Gampopa. That's mm, 900 years ago. Uh, and there's Vajrayana. Vajrayana is very different. There are people who, uh, in Tibet, these, these were practiced in so many different ways. Some people said, well, you have to do this before you do this. And other people said, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. And so there's a lot of fluidity here. But one of the things that is, uh, people don't understand is that what's result in one path is uh, method in another and vice versa. So in Vajrayana, the effectiveness of Vajrayana is more about your ability to let the spirit of the deity take you over. As Michael said earlier, it's based in magic. And when you conjure up a deity, uh, well, you conjure up the deity and then you feel the presence of the deity, or if you're doing advanced magic, you, let the, you invite the deity in and you let you become the deity, and the, the spirit of the deity takes you over. That's pretty scary stuff. That's magic. And what makes Vajrayana so brilliant is that these magical techniques were appropriated for spiritual ends, not simply sorcery ends. So you let the spirit take you over. And here we have the spirit is the union of compassion and emptiness. And you let that infuse your whole being. And the result of that is shamatha and vipassana. It actually goes the opposite way. And there are, there are many other examples that I can give. Now, there's an old saying in Tibetan, every valley its own dialect, every monastery its own teaching, I'm oh, sorry, its own, tr own tradition, and every lama his or her own teaching. So there's a multiplicity here. And the mo most important thing is you find a way of practice that works for you. That's the most important thing. You know, and Atisha is one of the great Tibetan masters, uh, great Indian masters who came to Tibet, studied with one yogin who and learned incredible logic, became a red hot debater. And then he had all these visions about bodhicitta. And he went to his teacher and said, I want to study bodhicitta, awakening mind. He said, nah, don't need that stuff. Don't know anything about it anyway. And uh, the teacher said, well, that's what I need to do. So I'm going to find someone who can teach me about that. And his teacher got very angry with him for leaving. But that's what Atisha did. He made offerings, thanked his teacher for what he'd received, and took his leave. Because that's what he needed to know. Okay? There's another question back there, I think. Should we end it? It's probably the last. Okay. One more question. Last call. There's one right here. Thank you. So I've been practicing Tibetan Buddhism for, I don't know, 25 years or so. I, 
I'm losing count. And uh, it's really changed my life. You know, I owe my life to it in, in many ways. And um, I think the last five or so years have been more difficult with um, being a woman in the tradition. Um, and the abuse scandals that are coming out in the tradition and many people feeling very disheartened um, and myself struggling on, on many levels in many ways and wondering if you grapple with this issue at all and also in my mind I'm trying to reconcile the, the teachings, the the wisdom and the compassion it's produced in individuals, and yet traditionally the continued like systematic oppression of women in the, the patriarchy in the tradition. And I'm not sure how to reconcile those, um, especially when I, I teach you know, at a university and, and teach <laughs> um, and give the teachings, and then I'm trying to kind of reconcile, you know, with the facts on the ground. So I'm just wondering how you grapple with this, or you know, reconcile the paradox. What's the paradox for you? The paradox is the transformation of our consciousness towards more compassion, right? More caring relieving the suffering of others, and yet the systematic oppression of women uh, in the tradition, um, in the treatment of, yeah. and, and, and the, the, you know, the, the abuse. Well, I started to teach in the mid 80s and uh, I don't know whether you recall but uh, that period of time there were I call it the firework era fireworks era because there was one teacher after another going up in flames for exactly the same reasons you're describing So I made, I, I, I took very careful note, examined what was happening and why. And what I saw, what I observed, is that at that time all of these problems developed because the individual in question had become isolated in by the institution. So I took note of that. And uh, And I could talk about this for quite a long time, but we're coming to an end this evening. For myself personally, I made a point of putting two mechanisms in place. One was I always taught beginners because that kept me in touch with the world. And the second is that I always had at least one person, but usually two or three, from whom I had no secrets. Because I figured if I didn't keep a secret from them, it was very difficult to keep it a secret from myself. 
And those uh, two mechanisms served me very well. But there was a cost to that. And the cost is that I didn't form any institution. Uh, didn't have the skills, perhaps. But I also didn't have the inclination. And uh, I think the most important thing is what I've said a couple of times earlier this evening. There are inequities in the world. It doesn't matter what the society. That's the nature of life. Some people devote themselves to doing what they can to uh, remedy inequities. And and I've met people doing that that I think are actually really quite extraordinary people. But as I said to this woman here, these are elements in our landscape. It would be a tragedy to let yourself be limited by them. Is it harder? Yeah, it is. I know. I've worked with a lot of women. It's harder. And uh, there's one of, of my students who's a retired professor who says, you know, uh, you have to do twice as much to be treated the same. And uh, And I don't have any answer for that. But I also don't see that as a impediment to spiritual practice. It's spiritual practice is not about making the world perfect. It's about being at peace, deeply at peace, in the world in which we live. And When you know that peace in yourself, so many other things become possible. But there's so many things about the world that uh, we seem unable to change. I mean, 
nobody thought that Europe would descend into war. No, a very violent, full-on war. 15, 20 years ago. And here we are. Uh, it doesn't make war excusable. But there it is. So, yes. You know, the I find it... Mapping, I would say, that uh, women have not been recognized for their abilities over the centuries. Two of the most uh, important scientists in the 20th century were women. Most people have never heard of them. Almost all of the composers in the 19th century studied under one woman. I can't remember her name right now, but one woman. But nobody knows her name. I came across that rather strangely. I went, oh, that's so interesting. But this doesn't stop you from uh, forging your own path. And that's what's important. Don't let the world hold you back. I don't know whether that's a reconciliation or not. But uh, that's about all I can say. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And I think you may well have the conditions to practice in a safe place with with ethical teachers and may yeah. we all create those conditions yeah. I mean for those that to happen yeah that would be wonderful I mean we get a lot of nonsense thrown at us it's very very clear when you read the uh, text and commentaries if the situation if, if the situation is such that you feel you cannot learn in that environment, then you take your leave. That's why I get told the story about Atisha. He, there was something he wanted to learn. He couldn't learn it from this person, so he took his leave. There are many, many reasons which will make a situation impossible for us to learn. And then, and that's a feature in our landscape. I remember I got a phone call, had a long conversation with a woman who was in a center in which she discovered what was going on. And uh, It was very hard for her because she had many friends and uh, many aspects of that particular group, practice, things like that, that she loved. But she couldn't practice there anymore. She couldn't study there anymore. And she just felt that she was trapped in such a situation. And You're never trapped. I mean, I don't know whether you have read any, uh, the piece by Amanda Knox that came out recently. It's in Barry Weiss's Substack. Uh, it's quite moving. She was imprisoned for a murder that she did not do. There wasn't a shred of evidence for it. And uh, facing 26 years in prison. 
And at some point, she puts it, she says, I don't know what an ep epiphany is like, but this epiphany was like a cold shower or cold water. I can't remember exactly what she wrote. And her epiphany was, oh, this is not the life I wanted to lead. This is a pretty sad life. But it is my life. My life isn't out there where I want it to be. This is my life. And she stopped fighting her life. And she writes about it very beautifully, very, very well. And it was very clearly a wisdom that emerged or that she brought to the situation, I don't know. And, uh, and then she started to make, uh, make do what she could of her life, make, make every day worthwhile in prison. And she figured out how to do that. Now, it's eventually, lawyers and others managed to have the case retried, and she was freed, and now is married and has children. It was a very, very different life. That's a hell of an obstacle, but she didn't let it be an obstacle. And I think there's something we can learn. Often it is our own mind that traps us in ways that we aren't aware of. Uh, I've seen this in myself over and over again. And I go, oh. And I've had to look and see what, uh, what am I holding on to. And if I can find that and let it go, then other things become possible. And I've seen this in both men and women that I've worked with over the years, over and over again. But I found the story of Amanda Knox quite extraordinary, and I think it's well worth reading. Okay? Good. Should we just sit for a moment? And... Uh, I very much appreciate the level of attention that all of you brought to this evening. And I have the very definite feeling that something good here happened this evening. And I would like us all to sit for a few moments and uh, make the wish this is a little bit of magic we're going to do now. That uh, in ways that we may not understand or even know, that the goodness, whatever form that's taken for you this evening, finds a way to help others become free of their struggles in life. So just form that wish right now and sit with it for a few minutes. In the Tibetan tradition, we call this dedication or sharing. So there we are. If you've heard anything this evening that makes sense to you, take it. Let it work like a seed in you and let it grow. Back to your life. We're done for now. We're done. We're done, done. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. Completely done. Completely done. Not quite completely. So first of all, thank you, Ken. You're very welcome. Really appreciate uh, you coming and speaking with us this evening. My pleasure. And Katie, you're doing announcements at this point? Hi, everyone. Thank you again, Ken, for joining us and for your time and all of the great answers. Really appreciate it and all of the work you've done. I know that the, there's a lot of appreciation in this community for the writing and translating that you've done, and we're really glad to have you. So thank you again. Um, please feel free after this to stay. We have tea in the lobby, which you can help yourself to. And Ken is going to stay for a little while oh, and yes. sign books. Um, so he's being very generous with his time. Please don't take advantage of it. Like, this is not like a practice interview opportunity, um, <laughs> but the book is in the lobby, and uh, uh, Ken will sign it for you. Um, so, and yeah, please stay, have tea, talk to people, meet new people. For those of you who haven't been here before, I just want to tell you a little bit about this place and what happens here. So we have kind of a funny name. Uh, the name is the Alembic. And an alembic is an alchemical vessel for transformation. Um, we hope that this space is also a container for transformation according to your own goals, where your practice is at this moment and where it can go. So to that end, we host events and workshops and um, classes that are from all different traditions so that you can go and find the thing that is really speaking to you and that's alive for where you are at this moment. We're arranged around kind of three pillars, um, which is meditation and movement, um, embodied curiosity in the form of citizen science, uh, and uh, psychedelic, imaginal, and visionary culture. Um, and running through all of those pillars is a thread of creativity. So we host art workshops um, and other things about creative expression also. If you want to keep up with us, the best way to do that is to sign up for the mailing list. And there'll be uh, a form on the iPad in the lobby. And um, you can put your info in there and you'll get the newsletter, which is written by Sasha Chapin. So if you like the newsletter, um, I've, I have been getting people like DMing me on Twitter and sending me emails about how great the newsletter is. So you can tell Sasha that you like the newsletter. Um, and tonight is also special because if you're, a, if you're a founder of Alembic, raise your hand. All three of us are here. So I'm Katie. This is Eric. Uh, this is Michael, if you hadn't noticed him there. Um, <laughs> And so if you have questions or comments or something you would like to see that we're not currently offering, you have the entire founding team here tonight. Um, so come find us, chat with us in the lobby. Thank you for being here. Thank you again. Great to have you. See you all out there. <laughs>